Okay, well, I'm gonna go ahead and introduce everybody. So my name is Tanya Anders. I'm a faculty member in the Earth Sciences and Astronomy Department. I'm also a member of our Sustainability Committee here on campus. And we have a couple of other faculty with us. Today, our goal is to um, have a conversation about the environment and maybe some things that have happened and changed since COVID-19 but also really just to um, engage in a conversation with each other about the environment since it's Earth Day. Um, we invited a couple of faculty members to be here uh, on a panel, but we have other faculty members here as well, so everybody um, may chime in, of course. But let me start by introducing the faculty members um, that are here. And I was going to go in alphabetical order, but now I think I'm just going to go by how I see them on the screen here in front of me. So um, we have Richard Hanna. So Richard, if you could please unmute yourself and briefly introduce yourself to everybody. Uh, well, welcome everybody. And Tanya, thank you so much for inviting me to this. It was awesome. Um, I am a professor of culinary arts uh, for the business divisions consumer science and design technology department in culinary arts. And I'm um, a full time in my second year as a full time faculty, which yay, I'm so happy. And thank you, Tanya, again. But um, uh, I teach sustainability and I'm teaching it right now. Uh, and while I say my sustainability culinary 112 class, I teach sustainability in the uh, hospitality industry. Um, sustainability sustainability and uh so that's what i teach and it's uh exciting to me and i'm glad to be a uh, part of this today i teach a lot of stuff but as we talk about today and i'm really excited because there's so many things going on uh in the covid 19 era uh that's had dramatic impacts on uh on the environment on sustainability as whole on food waste on so many areas that make up uh, sustainability and I'm having such a great time uh, sharing it right now with my students. Awesome, wonderful. Well the next one I see up on my screen here is Dave Morofka. Um, so Dave if you could please unmute yourself and introduce yourself. Uh, Dave Morofka and I am in uh, Earth Sciences and Astronomy and I think I've been here 10 years um, and I teach physical geology and earth science lecture and lab, and also uh, our climate change class. So a couple years ago, I wrote a climate change class, and uh, I think we're on our third semester of teaching that. And uh, I'm, I'm fascinated by climate change. I, I like to work with students to look at what the data shows in terms of natural climate change and anthropogenic climate change. And uh, so I'm looking forward to sharing an element of, of some things that maybe are, are changing at a, a rapid rate and thinking about like, what kind of an impact they, that might have, if it does. Wonderful, thank you so much. And next we have Kelly Rivera. Hi everyone. Um, so I am a professor of political science here at Mount Sac, and I'm happy to be here. Tanya invited me last night, um, so hi. Um, I am interested absolutely in looking at the intersection of climate change and politics. It's something that um, is definitely a major issue in terms of the global political structure that we have. If we're thinking about um, famine, mass migration, uh, how that impacts uh, immigration policy around the world, these are all things that are happening now and will likely continue to increase. So some really serious considerations on the political side associated with climate change. And I'm also just delighted to be here and see all of your wonderful faces and pictures. So thanks for having me. Thank you so much for joining us on such short notice too. All right. Hi, I'm Sophia and I'm part of Associated Students. I'm the student rep on the Sustainability Committee. Other faculty members or sustainability committee members that would like to? Maybe I can jump in? Yes, absolutely, Craig. Uh, my name's Craig Peterson. Uh, let me explain to those people that do not know me. I do not have Corona voice. Uh, this has been this way 12 years. It's a, a past vocal cancer incident, and so I've got this rusty voice. Um, I'm a full-time professor in the biological sciences. Uh, teach the uh, 
Humans in the Environment course Bio 6, along with uh, Karen, Karen Gakiba Russell, who's with us today, and also Mark Cooper, who's working with his students today. So it's good to see you familiar faces and you unfamiliar faces too. So glad to be here and glad to be alive. It's good to see you too, Craig. And uh, Karen, you're not on my screen, but I'm glad that, to know that you're here. I'm James Stone. I'm a professor in political science and geography, along with uh, Kelly, and on the uh, sustainability committee for uh, several years, which uh, Craig, Karen, and I were among the original co-founders of. Hi, I'm back. Uh, oh, my awesome. oh, sorry, my name is Mark Borita, and I teach geology and astronomy classes with Dave and Tanya. And um, I also uh, have been doing experiments in a secret laboratory on campus that has to do with, um, with potential um, temporary mitigation of climate uh, uh, temperature uh, change. And um, I will divulge that if, uh, if uh, called upon to do so. <laughs> Otherwise, I have also been teaching about earthquakes uh, through the department and, um, and most of my classes are heavily infused with sustainability practices. I got right. it. I'm One more um, here. Hi there, Steve Williams. I uh, teach horticulture there on campus and also maintain the sustainability demonstration garden that's out on the farm. Uh, so I've been there for 15 years and the garden's been in existence for about five and uh, we demonstrate sustainability. So I hope you'll come out and see what we've got going on. So I am going to um, share my screen now so that I can show a few slides and then we'll jump in and have um, our um, panelists share so much. Okay, um, welcome again, everybody. So today marks the 50th anniversary of Earth Day. And the first thing that I wanted to share is a YouTube clip. Dr. Anders, is there volume? There is. Only a little sound there, there's no talking. So for the interpreters, there don't need there does not need to be any. Okay. Thank you. 
All right, so let me um, go back to my PowerPoint here. Okay, so you see my PowerPoint again? Not yet. Not yet, okay. Let me do a stop share. This is okay. harder to do when you have so much open. Okay. Yeah, good. Okay, so I asked my students in my oceanography classes this semester to contribute and a, one of my students sent me three slides. So I'm sharing the slides that my students sent to me. So thank you for that. Um, so he found some images um, right here from close to us, um, LA, and how the smog levels have dropped and since Corona hit. So yay for that, right? Um, he also found some images from other parts in the country. Um, if we go to the middle of the country in Chicago, um, the smog levels have dropped. Same on the East Coast in Florida. And if we continue even further and go overseas, um, here are two images from Spain. Um, so you can see, especially over Madrid, how the nitrogen dioxide emissions have considerably dropped. Um, between if you, this is a comparison of last year to this year. And then if we keep traveling even further to India, then we can also see a, a dramatic change. So um, this is all thanks to COVID-19, right? Um, and so one of the things that often comes up then is um, CO2 concentrations in the atmosphere as this is one of the greenhouse gases. And this is one of the reasons why we asked Dave to be here because we are hoping that he can um, share some of his expertise since he's our climate um, expert here. So I'm not gonna go into that. I wanna, in a, um, in, again, welcome our panelists. Sophia, as, did you get the correct link to ERA? To ERA? Yeah. Oh, um, yeah. I'll check in with her. You'll have to look into that. Okay, but everybody else is here and we've already introduced themselves. Um, them, so I'm going to stop sharing my screen now. It looks like your co-host. So awesome. So we're going to turn it over to Dave, who will um, teach us a little bit more about climate change. Oh, I got to unmute myself there and I'll, uh, I'm glad you didn't talk too much more about that last slide because No, uh, no, no. I, I, have, I, was, a, I have a duplicate. <laughs> so I won. But uh, I thought I liked the 1970s guy, and so I was able to dig into my cycling wear and find a green headband because the 1970 guy had a green headband on. So I'm going to... Didn't gonna, they look so much cooler? Now you look super cool. So I'm going to do the green headband in honor of the, the 1970 guy in the, in the video. Yeah, so Tanya asked me to talk. Um, you guys can see the slides. Good? Okay. Let me minimize the uh, faces there. There you go. Um, so Tanya suggested that I talk about this, you know, an intersection between, um, you know, I want to try to take 10 minutes and I'm famous for going like over 10 minutes in one slide and I've got like eight. So I'm going to do my best here to get through this stuff and keep it so pretty, pretty fundamental on each slide just to not to go into a lot of detail about the, to talk about the intersection between COVID-19 and, and climate change and suggested sort of maybe sharing a little bit about greenhouse gas emissions and CO2 and what have we been able to detect and has it been changed. So uh, several things that I, I want to sort of try to touch on, what's the effect of COVID-19 on atmospheric CO2? Uh, um, do we see any impact yet? To, uh, or could there be any impact to human-caused global warming? And I'll save that for the, for the end. And uh, why does it matter? What are greenhouse gases anyway? So there's a, there's a, a slide on here that's are several pictures and a lot of pictures are like this. We just saw a couple have become from Tanya's students uh, have become sort of famous because they show pictures of, of uh, you know, a very smoggy, in this case, New Delhi, India, and then a very clear New Delhi, India, um, taken in two different, you know, one in November and one on March 30th. And uh, there's certainly, I'm sure that there's, a, there's an impact on atmospheric pollution because of 
what's happening right now in the world over the last couple of months. Um, I, I like to work with my students on being swayed by, by the data and not always by things that are, <clears throat> are evocative. So I've sort of picked on this picture a little bit. Um, and let's see if I can move on. Oh, I gotta go down here in presentation mode. So um, it's important to, and we'll probably hear some about this from, from our political science faculty and friends, that climate change is a highly politicized and socially energized topic. Um, but understanding it is a, is a real science and involves a lot of disciplines. So here are two pictures. So my first question when I saw those pictures today, that's because that's the first time I saw them, was you know, that the statement is, oh, well, look, here's a clear picture and here's a smoggy picture, and this is because of the shutdown in, in, um, in industries. And so it's, it's important to be swayed by the data. So here are two other pictures. And these are, this is a picture of uh, India on a clear day. And this is a picture a day later or a day earlier. So sometimes these, these images can be about like other things that are happening other than just um, maybe the slowdown in, slowdown in India history and the slowdown in burning of fossil fuels. So this combination of images shows, you know, tourists in New Delhi, sort of the same images, but for, different reasons because this is pre sort of pre pandemic. Um, so uh, it's important to note that there are certainly right in India and other parts of the world, there are definitely measurable changes, right? So much lower levels of particulate matter or PM 2.5. So stuff that's under two and a half microns. Um, week one of shutdown in India was 70% lower. And that's obviously very connected to uh, nitrous oxide, nitrogen oxide or nitrogen dioxide as well, right? Because this, this is stuff coming out of vehicles and power plants. So 71% as well in week one, which is great because these are all highly toxic things. How about CO2 though? Um, so I want to focus on changes in carbon dioxide and try to look at some, some data. Here's a graph in front of us of CO2 concentrations in the atmosphere of the last 400,000 years. So proxy data from ice cores and then instrumental data here. And we can see that for the last 400,000 years, CO2 hasn't been above 300 parts per million. And then since 1950, it, it got above that, that level and has climbed up to, uh, let's see, I think I looked today and it was about 416 something, 416 and change. So April 21st, 2024, 16, and a year ago, about 414 parts per million. So um, if you're not familiar with greenhouse, the greenhouse effect of greenhouse gases, as simply as I can put it, greenhouse gases like CO2 and methane and other gases in the atmosphere are really good absorbers of outgoing heat. So instead of, instead of the earth losing all of its heat at night, uh, some of that energy is trapped during the day and even trapped at night. By, not really trapped, but just absorbed by greenhouse gases. So we don't we don't cool off as much as we would other cool off otherwise cool off because of the greenhouse gases. Uh, carbon dioxide is not a it's not a powerful greenhouse gas, but it's not nearly as powerful as say methane. But it's the important greenhouse gas because it's for humans because it's what we put into the atmosphere mostly, right? So it's the gas that we're sort of most interested in because we we add the most of it. Um, so it's interesting to look at where that CO2 comes from. So this is a data set from 2017 and it shows um, CO2 entering the atmosphere. And so this is, a, you can see that the CO2 is coming from the places we would expect, right? North America and Europe and India and Asia and a little from coastal areas of South America and, and South Africa as well. And this is both, you know, this, this is all due to the burning of fossil fuel and food production industry, transportation. So we can see CO2 input from transportation tracks here, airplane flights, right? All, all this stuff in blue over the ocean. So that's very interesting. So it, the question then is, right, if, if every country in the world has shut down, paused, or slowed down its economy, um, it's reasonable to ask, can we, can we maybe measure some sort of impact on atmospheric CO2 and how much, how much impact there might, might there be. Um, one important question, and so I didn't really expect to find what I found, um, and maybe some of you have looked at this data as well, but I was a little surprised by it because I, we know that the atmosphere is very well mixed, and when we sam sample the atmosphere in one place, usually we're, we're, we're sampling for something that's, that's global. So we're looking for a global signal. So if there's something that's happening for us to detect it globally, there has to be some times for, time for mixing of the atmosphere and mixing of the CO2 throughout the, throughout the atmosphere. Um, so here we see uh, CO2 for 22nd of March, 2020. So it's a couple of days, or today, today, yesterday. Um, and CO2 is higher over the Northern Hemisphere, right? It's still sort of winter in the hemisphere in the Northern Hemisphere, so we're born, burning more fossil fuels and heating houses and doing all that stuff. So you can see much higher levels of CO2 in the Northern Hemisphere than in the Southern Hemisphere. 
So what does the, the question is, what does the data show? So this is the slide that uh, is somehow coincidentally exactly like yours. And uh, one of the ways or places that we measure global CO2 levels in the atmosphere, we monitor that. It's monitored by NASA at the Mauna Loa Observatory, and it's been done since 1958. So you can see a trend in increasing CO2 concentration in the atmosphere. Um, from this data in Mauna Loa. And then if we break that down a little bit and look at 2016 through 2020, we can really clearly see these well-defined um, trends. We can see the overall trend in the CO2 data, and then also we can solve, see the, the increase in CO2 as we go into May. May is usually the, the high CO2 month. And then a decrease as the Northern Hemisphere is the uh, as the vegetation in the Northern Hemisphere, since that's where most of the land is, that's where most of the vegetation growth is, and so photosynthesis starts to draw down or take CO2 out of the atmosphere. So that's the reason for this, this downtrend. So there's this cyclicity, but the, it's the overall trend that's, that's obviously important. Um, if we go into a little more detail and look at Mauna Loa Observatory data, it becomes very interesting. We just talked about this, this issue of, well, there ha because the atmosphere is globally mixed, right, and you're, if you sample it in one place, you're not, especially Mauna Loa in the middle of the Pacific, you're not, you're not really looking at a, a signal of just what's happening in Hawaii or what's happening right there, but you're, you're, looking, at, you're looking at data from this well-mixed atmosphere. And so if we look at the, the data starting at uh, 2000, October 2018 through pretty much, you know, the last couple days. I think this is the last data point on here is, is maybe yesterday. Um, we see that there's the, the trend that we would expect from last year and then we decreased and we're going in, an increasing trend as we sort of go towards May. And then there's this very interesting kind of flattening or um, a slowdown, let's call it a slowdown in CO2 increase in the last couple months. So it seems that you know, there's some data that actually suggests that what, what economies are doing has had an impact already on uh, global atmospheric levels. And we can see the same trend here when we look at the last six months of atmospheric CO2 measurements. There's this flattening or slowdown of CO2 increase. So um, I, what for me is the most interesting part of this for, for what I would teach in a class and for my students is to think about how much of an impact does this have? So my question is down there. So that's good for the global warming, right? Or good for not the global warming, but good for global warming. So um, I don't want to spend a lot of time talking about the carbon cycle. I just want to make a couple points about this, this uh, illustration of the carbon cycle. And oops. so in the atmosphere, there's a lot of CO2, right, or a lot of carbon in the form of CO2. Like I said, if we took all the carbon out of the CO2 and piled it up, it would be 750 billion tons of carbon. So there's a lot of carbon there. And normally, just going on, the, the Earth going on with sort of its natural cycle, the Earth has, does a really good job of balancing what comes in. So we don't need to worry about the units or anything. There's a lot of carbon in the atmosphere, and a little bit comes in from volcanism every year. And that's balanced by a little bit that goes out, right? It's a cycle, it's the carbon cycle. Um, however, the problem is there's this reservoir of 4,000 billion tons of fossil fuel, and actually a lot more than that, that we've been using for the last several hundred years. And so we're putting that CO2, right, that carbon in the form of CO2 back into the atmosphere at a rate that's like 60 times the natural norm or the natural sort of average, right? 60 times uh, this 0.1. So it's, we're putting it in a lot faster than, than nature normally puts it in through volcanism. So the problem is we're burning fossil fuels, right? That we're at a rate of 60, to, 60 times more CO2 to the atmosphere than the natural cycle. Um, and then we think about, well, what's the predicted decrease in fossil fuel use as we go through the slowdown in economies? Right now it's about 5%, maybe 10% max. Well, what that means for CO2, because the question is, and, and what some of what I saw on the internet was, well, this is gonna impact global warming. It's gonna, maybe this will help solve global warming. And so these big kind of powerful phrases like that. Well, a, a 5% change in fossil fuel use will mean that the, the rate at which we're putting CO2 in the atmosphere slows down to about 57 times as much or as fast as natural processes. So that's, it's not a big impact. Even if, even if we were able to cut fossil fuel use in half, Right? It's still 30 times as much as is happening because of 
natural processes for volcanism. So um, the, the, I sort of, I guess the, the unfortunate thing is, is that we'd have to do a lot more than this to really impact the, the rate at which carbon or CO2 is increasing the atmosphere. Um, the, the upside maybe is that this is, is really nice evidence of, of where CO2 in the atmosphere is coming from. Not that most people doubted that, but there are those people out there who doubt where CO2 in the atmosphere is coming from or why it's increasing in the atmosphere. And uh, I think it also gives us a real sense of, well, and it's a little scary in a way, but it's, it's starting somewhere. How much would we actually need to scale down to affect some sort of significant change? When you, when you imagine you know, global economies shutting down or slowing down and uh, the level of impact that there's been after that, um, we get a sense for how much is required for true, for true change. So that's all I have. Wonderful. I'm trying Thank to stop you. sharing. There we go. I'll give this give the screen back up here, I think. Oh. Yep, there we go. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. And love your 70s look. <laughs> and I really appreciate that you um, mentioned about you know how photos can be sending the right information and wrong information. And as much as we all love, for example, the dolphins in Venice, um, that was all just fake news, right, as we like to say these days. And so it is so important to look at data. And um, so thank you for presenting all that wonderful um, data. Sure. Um, so um, I would like to invite now either um, Kelly or Richard to speak because as Dave said, we all need to make changes to our lives if we wanna um, positively impact um, our uh, climate and, and the planet's health overall. And so for Kelly, I would have the question, like what, um, I guess I'm trying to say is like, why is it so often that laws have to change before humans make a difference? And how, how hard is it to get laws into place um, that um, forces people to make a difference? And I'm thinking, for example, here in California, just when I moved here, a couple of years ago, they finally passed a law that you have to pay for your plastic bags in the grocery stores. I grew up in Europe and I've been used to that for like 40 years probably. And so I thought it was really interesting how people started making a change here because now all of a sudden they had to pay five cents um, for a bag and they finally started using um, cloth bags. Um, so I guess my question to you is, um, is about the, the process of uh, getting um, things into law, um, how complicated that may be. Okay, so the short answer is um, really complicated, <laughs> right? But the uh, I think there is also another answer that maybe is more hopeful, and is that those laws come because people are active and interested in creating them. For example, the plastic bag law came through a proposition, so that ended up on our ballot because citizens believed that was the right way forward that plastic pollution, particularly they were focused on ocean pollution at the time, was out of control and that we could do something as simple as not consume as many plastic bags at the grocery store. So it started there, people collected signatures, right, and it gets on the ballot and then we all vote for it. That year was a little confusing, so if you all remember voting, um, this was 2016, I think this was on the ballot. Um, James, jump in if I'm getting that one wrong. I'm pretty sure it was 2016 though. And there were actually multiple plastic bag propositions, which confused students and, that I had who were studying all the propositions at the time, and also just reg regular voters who wanted to know what they were voting on. Um, and that's because you've got industries who are interested in protecting the plastic bag uh, economy, so to speak, companies that create plastic bags and sell plastic bags, right? It's, it's, these things, it's working for them. They're not interested in the change. So, the reason why you have to pay and why it's even available for you to buy plastic bags is because of, of that industry coming in to try to protect themselves. Um, so we got a little off track with plastic bags, but it's just to say that it does take uh, our interest and our force of will in order to create change. If you go back to when um, Earth Day was first established in 1970, and you look at the political movements at the time, um, and you take a look at who's actually involved, 
it starts out as a grassroots movement, but it gradually changes. And by the time Nixon is president, a Republican president, you actually have widespread bipartisan support for um, laws to regulate climate change, pollution, um, everything from the Clean Air Act, the establishment of the EPA. This is all happening at that time in the 1970s with bipartisan support. So there's actually been a political shift over the last 20 to 25 years, this politicization of climate change that Professor Morka talked about. Um, and it's it's disheartening because it's a human issue. It really shouldn't be an issue that you see on the, the left side or the right side. Um, it impacts all of us. But it is a bit fascinating to see how that, that uh, clear political divide, which of course we've been living through a deepening political divide over the last 25 years um, across a multitude of issues. This is just one of them, but it may be the most dire issue to have us separated over politically because it does take a coordinated effort in order to combat the, the damage of climate change. Um, one of the things that I think is sort of interesting about studying efficacy for climate change on, a, on the governmental level is the fact that in the United States, we have these 50 different jurisdictions, the states. But pollution and uh, you know, CO2 doesn't, doesn't stop at the California border or the Arizona border or, or Florida. It, it goes across our borders, and yet we write laws within these jurisdictions. So it's difficult when, when sort of no one has jurisdiction over the entire area, or in fact the globe, if you start thinking about crossing uh, political boundaries internationally, then in a sense sort of no one takes responsibility for those changes. We did see um, efforts with the Paris Climate Accord, but we also know that the results of that haven't been what we had hoped for. And then of course our own government under the Trump administration pulled out. Um, we saw the Trump administration starting to roll back climate protection, uh, particularly Clean Air Act regulations are being rolled back right now, or at least proposed to be rolled back. This is problematic. Um, and if you link it with COVID-19, we also know that, uh, or at least we're starting to see patterns, that death rates are higher from COVID-19 in areas where um, air pollution is higher. So these two things aren't um, unrelated. They are critical to observe. Um, you had sent me a question about whether or not COVID-19 and the environment would be um, critical in our next election for president. And um, I don't know. I, I think it's hard to predict much with our political <laughs> environment right now. But um, I think that the economy is probably going to be front and center. And to the degree that environmental groups and people interested in um, driving the issue of climate change to the forefront, to the degree that they can tie that to economic prosperity, the better off the issue would be. So if those two things can be linked up, then you might get a broader base of support pushing for environmental policies that not only make us healthier and our planet healthier, but also put more money in our pockets. If we can figure out how to link those two, will probably have a stronger chance of seeing um, more change uh, for the better when it comes to stemming the, the tide of climate change. So yeah, lots to think about there. I'm happy to answer questions. I think we're taking those at the end, right, Sonia? Yes, we're gonna take questions at the end and anybody who would like to ask questions, if you could just please type them into the, the chat box. Um, so thank you so much, um, Kelly, for, for that. Um, so in other words, if we want to make change, we need to go out, collect signatures, and we need to register the vote, and we all need to vote. We need to do yeah, more change. That's right. I also want to say, like, I'm really heartened by the interest of, of all the different generations who are interested in this topic. I have an 11-year-old son. He's in fifth grade. And he and his friends started a group just on their own. It wasn't an assignment. Um, it wasn't my idea. I know you might be thinking like, oh, I, you know, what a weird kid. It's, he's a professor's kid. Maybe that's why he's doing this. But I swear, I didn't push him to do this. He just came home and told me one day he started a group with his friends called Climate Changers for the school. And they started a, like a Google Meet group. 
and all the kids in their class who are interested in different grades, like they get together now once a month and they talk about what they can do. And that's the sort of thing that makes me feel very hopeful um, about the future because they're just, they just want, they just want to keep the planet healthy. And, um, and I really admire the work that people are doing um, at that level. Just, you know, small changes in, in your community make a big difference. Yes, absolutely. And so going from the community to the individual, um, so I asked Richard <laughs> to tell us how we can all make a difference by making good choices about what we eat. So you want to share a little bit? Yeah, well, thank you, Tanya. I appreciate it. And Kelly, thank you. That was a really good information. You know, when we look at what's going on right now, uh, if we were going to say, just thinking about the environment. What's the best thing for the environment? You know, wipe half the uh, humans off the planet and uh, put an end to uh, combustion engines. And that's gonna solve our problems with the environment. Uh, it's gonna solve our problems with global warming and all the other things, but obviously it's not gonna happen. Um, when we look at though the effects of COVID, I just call it COVID-19, the life of COVID-19, you know, in our, our era, in our area, era of COVID-19, the first thing, and, and, and as David has spoken about and Mark has spoken a little bit about, is the fact that we have noticed that by reducing our use of cars by, you know, lockdown, it's clearly proven that the burning of fossil fuels and therefore the uh, cessation of burning of fossil fuels makes a huge impact. I mean, it, it destroyed the uh, price of oil and nothing's done that in history. You know, battles with the Middle East and everything else. Uh, I remember the 70s with my sister and dad and mom going to get gas based on the, uh, the, uh, the uh, even or odd number of the last digit of their license plates uh, in the 70s. Uh, we look at it and we say, we can clearly see now, and the data will continue to prove, uh, and as I think it was Mark, uh, Mark's, Mark or, or David showed, the uh, maps from today on the news of the difference in um, the atmosphere in areas of Spain and France. Uh, when we look at it, so I, I presented to my lecture on my uh, sustainability in the culinary arts class today, some interesting things. I told him last week, I'm going to watch the news for this week and I'm going to report on it to you. So my report to them was, uh, wow, I saw a commercial with uh, about Edison uh, and I didn't quite hear it right, but I thought they said that 30% of their uh, electricity to us as a source of electricity, 30% of the electricity that we use uh, actually comes from a renewable energy. And so, and I can point out here, I'm going to share it with you right now. And so I wasn't, uh, oh, I'm not able to share. That's right. So anyway, uh, the point is, like I have here, I can just read it to you. I go on to the uh, Department of Water and Power and I look at it and it says, wow, Department of Water and Power, renewable energy sources. And this is 2017, end of 2017, 30% of their, our energy, uh, the electricity that we get to our homes is generated through renewable energy and then it has a disclaimer that says renewable energy sources include biomass one percent geothermal four percent uh small hydroelectric four percent and solar at 11 and wind at 12 percent so obviously the solar uh and wind uh tends to be the um the main sources of uh gathering our electricity but there's some other impacts of COVID 19. Uh, ethanol production, so ethanol is in a lot of stuff, including our gasoline, right? We made ethanol get blended into our gasoline. Uh, ethanol, we went through a craze a few years ago with automobile industry of making our cars all dual fuel or bi fuel. They had some great names for it. Uh, it means it can burn ethanol or gasoline. Well, you know, we got a good part of our amount of ethanol in our gasoline's in, in, uh, increasing all the time, percentage wise. So anyway, I look at it and they say, COVID-19, ethanol production is down 30%. Uh, 
And now here, when we talk about sustainability, sustainability, particularly as it relates to uh, to uh, to the uh, any industry, hospitality industry, what I teach, is the fact that man. And in, in my classes, I just remarked today in my lecture on my classes last week assignments, pollution and food waste. Um, and when we look at the pollution that we create uh, just as an independent business, uh, we see that uh, it becomes a matter of a sustainable supply chain. So establishing a standard, uh, everybody, you know, it costs money to have a standard, I'm sorry. Uh, but every, and to stand by it's even more difficult, but to be able to understand that our businesses survive through us achieving a standard of exceeding the expectations of our customers and therefore those customers become loyal customers and loyal customers come back again and they bring other people who tell other people right that's a sustainable method of business is create customer loyalty period whatever industry you're in and so the thing that i realized in the decrease of the uh of ethanol is the fact that 34 of 45 ethanol plants have been closed and that's created a 30 percent so obviously the other ones that are remaining uh, are really pumping out you know a lot of work and then where's the effect food and beverage industry because and then we teach this in our in my culinary 111 uh, exploring beverages classes that we have a lot of ways to bring carbonation into things like beer uh, we uh, put it in a pressure container and we pump in carbon dioxide gas and that gives us carbonation for our beers and the rest of the industry uses it particularly as our um, uh, sodas. We put it in sodas and not just that, we put it in our bars for our little uh, uh, soda gun things. We have carbonated gas. So our carbonated gas or CO2 that we use in our industry comes as a byproduct of producing ethanol through the ethanol manufacturing. They, instead of releasing it to the atmosphere, they capture the carbon dioxide gas, gas and sell it as a byproduct. But now there's less ethanol being produced, therefore there's less available carbon dioxide gas to carbonate our beverages, and that will have an impact on the business. And I'm a big, big I'm a doomsdayer on one side, and I'm a big believer of, uh, you know, less, less, uh, less of us is better for the earth, but better for the earth may not be always better for us. And so the other things that I noticed that were really fascinating, this is just the news today, was the fact that uh, we have a 30% decrease in nitrogen dioxide, a gas, a, 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 a greenhouse gas, uh, in the Pacific Northwest. So the Pacific Northwest, because of its lockdown, and we know Boston's having a big problem too, New York's having a big problem, we've seen a direct impact of the, of the uh, lockdown of people such that the carbon, uh, uh, the, the nitrogen dioxide levels have dropped by over 30%. We've seen with, I'm a big, I'm a backpacker and I live in the, in the, in the Eastern Sierra, uh, Mount, Sierra Nevada mountains. And the funny part is, is that they're talking about Yosemite. And it was really funny watching the news and the valley floor, which has, you know, more pollution than you can imagine from people. So I'm kind of glad they should close it for a decade but I let it recover. But the fact is the bears are impacting it. And I've seen a lot of bears in the Sierra Mount, Sierra Nevada mountains. And, uh, and I spent a lot of time in Montana. And so here are bears all over the park and it's great, they're taking over. Another thing is, which uh, I think uh, Mark pointed out to, or, or David again, my apologies, pointed out that in this area of India, which by the way, has a billion people in India, uh, that they had pictures of uh, seeing the Himalaya mountains for the first time in decades because of the reduce, uh, reduction in uh, emitting smog related particles in the atmosphere from whatever it comes from, industry, people on the roads, mo India, a billion people, a lot of motorcycles, a lot of very smaller combustion engines. Uh, so anyways, really kind of fascinating to me. And then I love the doomsday part is that then on the news, there was a scientist, I don't recall where he's from, it's at University of Massachusetts, a scientist on there. And he's like, hey, don't get excited. Human, you can't trust humans. This is gonna be disastrous. 
We're having a great time now. You take a good look at those Himalaya mountains because when we're done with this COVID-19 thing, it's gone. You're never going to see it again. So the reality is that you can't trust humans as a scientist to make, this isn't enough for us to make a change. Yet for all of us that are interested in sustainability, we're kind of standing back like, wow, look what happens. Let's lock down communities for a month instead of rolling blackouts. Let's just have blackouts for lockdowns of communities throughout the year where no one can leave their city borders. And we know that we will make a dramatic impact uh, on our atmosphere. But of course, uh, you know, we could never, we could never do anything like that. So if we look at COVID-19 and try to put a good spin on it, uh, COVID-19 has been our savior uh, in, in sustainability. And it will continue to yield us amazing results that are factual that we can apply to our data that are extreme and we can now use in our formulations and hypotheses in the future of developing strategies where we can clearly uh, prove, get people out of their cars, use mass transit, convert everything to uh, non-fossil fuel emissions, uh, work for it. If you think about if we lost this and we all lived on electric, we can afford coal-fired power plants to power electricity for us without damaging the atmosphere, if you think about it. If everybody's not driving a car that emits carbon dioxide and everything else in the atmosphere and greenhouse gases through the burning of fuel, which means we're not refining fuel and all the pollutants that go into the atmosphere from refining fuel from crude oil, and we don't need crude oil, and uh, we just need coal from, the, from, from families from coal miners from Colorado. So we just need coal from taking it from the earth in which we have a plethora of, and the damage that's caused to the atmosphere is uh, nothing compared to the advantage of the atmosphere of us not using combustion engines, burning fossil fuel. So it's kind of dynamic. So I think we're gonna have a lot of stuff over the next five years or so really to study, especially after we get done with this thing and we unwind. Remember, we don't get done with this thing. We wiped out another billion people on the earth. That's not bad either for the environment. We get to an opportunity to really study the environment and how, it's, how we're impacting it directly. And we're looking at it now from this phase, but we're gonna look at it after this ends and we recoil and see how fast it expands again and uh, see whether or not, or these might be areas for us now to really focus on our attentions. On well, I agree, that's kind of your following up with what Dave said, how we're starting to see some data changing. So there's going to be a lot for, for the scientists to look at. I'm, I'm starting to see some of the first questions coming in, but I would like to give an opportunity for our next panelist, who is another scientist, um, to speak. So Mark, if you um, want to maybe unmute yourself and... Okay. So I have... Um been teaching earth sciences and, and astronomy classes in at Mount Sac for uh, almost 20 years now and um, and have watched things change as we go through so I'd just like to give you some some insight into some of the other aspects of how the earth has changed as a result of this this um, this pandemic and so really um, what what we can only help help hope has changed will be our attitudes as other people have said you know, it's really important uh, that 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 it's us, you know, that are are um, causing our own uh, sort of uh, troubles in this environment. And so, one of the things that has come up is, um, you know, some people have heard that uh, the Earth is now seismically quieter, and uh, that's a that's a real um, important thing for a lot of people to 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 address. They're like, oh wow, are we are we safe? You know, um, what does it mean? I mean, you're looking at this corona pandemic is making the earth shake less. Oh, my gosh. And the answer is, you know, uh, earthquakes are now over, right? Well, um, as, as uh, if we look at today's, uh, this is today, uh, the, the earthquakes that have occurred in California and Nevada uh, on a website uh, that's easily accessible to everyone. And if you uh, have visited this website before, uh, this is almost always what it looks like every single day. Okay, this, this website shows, again, you can think you can read the key on the right-hand side here. The, um, the, the little squares are, are, are colored by time, and uh, they're also the size by uh, how big the earthquakes are. 
and you can see that we're getting earthquakes all along the San Andreas Fault system um, and up through uh, around um, Ridgecrest in this area. If you guys remember last July 4th, there was a major, major earthquake in Ridgecrest followed by a second one two days later. And that continues to have aftershocks. And then there's been some up in here, uh, up by Mammoth Lakes. This is Mammoth Lakes. This is over by uh, Mono Lake in Bodie. Okay, there's a big earthquake uh, um, a couple of days ago. And then maybe you guys heard that uh, uh, Idaho had the biggest earthquake they've had in a long time. Okay, it was a magnitude uh, uh, 6.5 up in Idaho. And this, all, this happened on the, um, on the 1st of, of, uh, of April. Okay, so this is long after our COVID um, uh, epidemic has happened. And so the answer really is no. We're gonna keep getting our earthquakes. So, so again, what, the, what is the issue with this idea that the earth is seismically quieter? Well, really, um, it means the background noise has gone down. Okay, what it means is that um, I was trying to explain it to someone in my family this morning. I was saying, okay, so I'm sitting at a table with my, um, with my monitor on the floor, I'm sorry, my computer on the floor. And if I have a sensitive seismic station sitting on my desk, the, the seismic station could, could actually feel the vibrations of the, the computer whirring away at the, on the floor, okay? But if somebody came in and, and, um, and, and dropped some books on the floor, that also would be monitored. But I would also be able to detect the, um, the, the UPS truck that came by at the beginning of this show that I had to go out and, and, uh, and, uh, and satisfy. So, you know, these kinds of noises are the kinds of noises that have quieted down. The fact that the, the trucks are, are not as um, prominent on the roads, uh, there's fewer people driving. So I, I've supplied a, a graph that was put out by a Caltech uh, PhD student who's working in the, uh, in the seismology uh, um, lab over there. And the purple line on the graph, if you can follow that through all the day, you can see that the blue uh, spikes are daytime and the drops are nighttime noises. Basically, noises referring to the vibrations of the earth caused by, for example, traffic. And so the purple line is an average of those noises throughout the days. And you can see the weekends are quieter and then we go into the week again and it gets quiet in the weekend. But you can see that this is a, actually a much lower noise level that's happened uh, starting uh, with our, our um, isolation where uh, suddenly the state started to shut down. And that got all the news, that got, that got all the coverage and that's why those headlines came out. On the left-hand side, you can see a, a relatively older um, news article about noise in seismic, um, seismic um, studies. And if you read the fine print, if you could read it, you would see that this represents uh, seismic stations that are close to and farther away from a uh, train station, a uh, train tracks. And so you can tell that the noise is being affected, you know, um, by how close, you know, the, the passage of trains and how much, uh, you know, how far away you are from those. Okay. So all this, all this noise that is now quieter is really only in the top, you know, you know I'm going to say several, uh, maybe hundred feet of the earth. And it has nothing to do with earthquakes that are damaging to us. Okay, all it has to do with is our ability to detect the quieter earthquakes. Okay, so really, you know, we're not, we're not, uh, we're not going to say that we're safe from earthquakes. Okay. Uh, the other issue that I was asked about a little bit is, uh, is um, you know, what are these changes that we're talking about with cleaner air, you know, um, um, because of the limited travel, you know, by various methods and the fact that people aren't going to places and um, uh, as tourists or as business people, and you know, we're consuming less and less energy and stuff like this. You know, what is this with about this cleaner air? And uh, you know, Dave shared some some data from the uh, the Keeling the Keeling curve, the data that's being measured in terms of carbon dioxide emissions in the atmosphere. And I, I I'm not sure that I'm um, ready to say that we can see a dip in that yet. Although it does look uh, um, a little bit lower in the last couple of days. But, you know, if you look at this data, that's one point on the planet. They've also showed some animations of, uh, of carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere. And just last Thursday, um, there was a Von Karman lecture posted by the uh, Jet Propulsion Lab. And we hosted it at Mount, uh, at Mount Sac through our, um, well, actually, we didn't host this one because we were on uh, lockdown here. But 
but the, the, the link is on this, uh, on this slide, if you guys can see it, the YouTube video, because that was recorded. And it talks exactly about how NASA observes air, uh, Earth from air in orbit. Um, it's, it's, it's of no use to us really um, to have you know, point sources of information, uh, except that we can get what's called ground truthing from those. So we have several um, satellites that are orbiting the Earth that are monitoring carbon dioxide levels across the earth. And if they get the same value over the, the uh, Mauna, Mauna Loa where the uh, Keeling monitor is, then, uh, then we know that at least that that's valid data. Okay, so that's really important that we understand where our data comes from because it is all about the data and it is all about uh, you know, when we collected that data. I would like to also say that uh, you know, there are a whole uh, large number of these von Karman lectures and, and uh, now many years ago, they, they gave one about looking at ancient, or sorry, not ancient, but uh, um, um, paintings from the 1800s that were done in Europe in a period of time called realism painting. And uh, the realism painting movement actually tried to capture the actual colors of the air. Um, and Scientists at the lab were trying to um, look at those pictures and and turn them into numbers in terms of air pollution. In other words, they used those those pictures that people tried to paint as accurately as they could to match them with conditions that must have existed in terms of how much uh, air pollution there was. And so we use lots and lots of different kinds of information about getting uh, where getting that data um, uh, about what the atmosphere looks like. And so, yes, uh, Dave referred to the fact that this comes from many, many different uh, um, styles of, of, uh, of a gathering of data, lots of different mindsets from scientists. And I can't emphasize enough that, that uh, scientists across the globe always have come to the conclusion, they don't believe that global climate change is real and that there is a strong human influence on it these days, okay? Uh, there is a, a, a climate, it changes throughout the uh, throughout time. Uh, Dave showed some other the, um, some other graphs regarding how many um, you know how, how carbon dioxide levels have changed throughout longer periods of time. We see that global climate has changed naturally, uh, but but the issue today is that the climate is changing faster than many organisms can adapt to. Okay, so that's that's the issue uh, that we're really dealing with. Uh, it's not that not that global climate is changing, it's how fast it's changing. Uh, and we're, we're um, very much responsible for a lot of that. So I also want to just say, you know, that, uh, you know, we've enjoyed this clean air, right? We, we've, we've been able to see the mountains. It has been said that, um, that, that uh, someone did a study that said that uh, the, the death rates from this virus are higher in places where air pollution is worse. And so that's a, a strong uh, claim that lower, you know, that, that the COVID-19 has taken advantage of bad air pollution. And so that's, that's uh, something we might consider going forward. Do we like to have clean air? And if, if you do, then what are you gonna do about it? Okay, change is hard. But if you can limit your travel, ride your bike. You know, I, in my neighborhood, lots of people have started walking and riding their bikes. I noticed many, parents teaching their kids suddenly how to ride bikes. I had not seen that before. <laughs> uh, use public transportation. Mount Sac students get a free bus pass. And uh, there are plenty of other ideas about what you can do. Also, um, you know, as, as other people have said, uh, we need these lessons to be learned or we'll go back to polluting. Okay, Richard said that and the UN general has said that as well. The UN general just came out and said the United Nations has said that these are temporary side effects and if we just go right back to doing what we're going to do, then we're going to see uh, terrible pollution again. So these are some of the things you can do. I put together this other slide. Uh, uh, basically, idea, the idea is that uh, we're, a, we're a college here. And so I think most of us believe that knowledge is power. Um, but the other part of that saying is that with, with power comes responsibility. Okay, And so what you can do is you can learn more by taking some of these classes that I put up here, uh, learning as much as you can. Uh, if you saw yesterday's presentation on installing solar panels, uh, um, you know, there are ways to do that. You know, if you don't do it right now, maybe you look forward to doing it somewhere in your future when you have more control over your place where you live. Okay. Uh, you might consider driving an electric vehicle. Okay. There are, um, if we can make that out of clean electricity, 
then the the immediate problem of, of uh, carbon dioxide in, the, in our region goes down. Okay, it's, it, there is a, another issue about about the total carbon dioxide footprint of things, but uh, we're not going to address that here. Okay, that's a whole other other hour and a half. Okay, so that's what I have for you guys. Um, I will unshare my screen and you guys can ask questions. Thank you so much, Mark. Um, I love how you're encouraging everybody um, to take classes that incorporate <laughs> the environment and sustainability. Thank you so much for that. Um, so we have um, time now for questions. And I know that somebody had already asked a question um, and that is about composting. They want to build a compost and, and let me who asked the question? I, I believe Laura was asking Laura what can we do in means of composting or what are we currently doing here at Mount Sec? Yeah, this is Steve speaking. Uh, there's been talk about this for some time and uh, nothing's been done. There's a lot of factors that come into play. I've worked at uh, botanic gardens where composting was done regularly on a large scale. And the equipment is one, maintaining the equipment, people to operate it, and the insurance for them to operate it. Those are some of the factors, the safety factors that come into play with the insurance. But that shouldn't stop the campus from doing it. And, and we have enough green waste that's produced on campus and uh, in the culinary areas as well that could be incorporated into this. On my location there on the sustainable garden, we do some composting there. Labor is, the, is a factor for me. Uh, it's a lot of work. And so, uh, but we do our chair composting out there. And, and if I can add to that, and Stephen, thank you, man. And, uh, and we have more stuff to talk about together. Uh, the reality is that the state changed or created a law in regarding to food pay, uh, food waste, you know, we're looking at uh, between 30 and 40% of uh, food produced in the world is gone to waste. And we see the people who are food insecure growing in numbers astronomically. And another, I mean, I got that, I'm kind of, maybe I'm uh, looking at the good side as a doomsdayer, but COVID-19 has helped us with food banks as an example. Food banks have struggled in the challenges of being able to distribute food, their primary thing. Uh, now we see all over on the news uh, in different states of people with hundreds and hundreds of cars lined up uh, part of it, I'll just add from a culinary perspective, is it's citrus season. And so everyone's like, harvest all the citrus you have and let's give it to people. But, you know, the reality here is, as we look at it, is the fact that um, uh, we are required to compost in the hospitality business now throughout the entire state of California. And while we've had, you know, while the rollouts, how I won't, I won't waste our time and how the rollouts have come out, uh, through uh, uh, the channels of, you know, entrepreneurs versus uh, large uh, uh, waste people uh, like Athens and, you know, waste management who have kind of like, you know, taken over the monopoly in that area. And the reality is that now we have the food waste. Now I'm going to tell you something. I'm upset about it from a culinary perspective is that I'm constantly, uh, uh, I just say a little somewhat unpopular in the area, you know, take those cans outside. Students feel now like they can waste it and throw it away because they didn't cut the end of the onion. Well, I'm sorry, we're about food waste in our industry and food waste has lost, amount, lost revenue, lost profits. And uh, let's put it in a stock. Let's use it for something. Utilization uh, has become a thing. So I think we're actually committing greater uh, uh, composting opportunities through these methodologies, but we're also wasting more food that could have just been utilized in a better way than pulled out to you know statewide mandates on com composting with the monopoly wet waste management company. So I think it, that goes back to, you know, we can all do our, our little share here. And I, I want to um, go to the next question here. What's the consensus among scientists about what will the earth and its inhabitants face if we don't deal with climate change in time? Also, what electric vehicle is like the most environmental friendly? So Mark or Dave, do you want to take that one? <laughs> 
Uh, that's kind of a loaded question. Um, very loaded. <laughs> it is very loaded. I mean, so for electric vehicles, for starters, like Mark was saying, of course, if you have solar panels on your roof and you charge your vehicle that way, then great. But if your electricity comes from a coal burning power plant, then your electric vehicle is probably still polluting. Um, so, but so let me just add, one of the things you might do is look at your electric bill and or go to the website, whichever electric company you have, they have a, a, a requirement that they put out what the mix is in terms of the electric power generation that you're using. And it used to be that there was a lot more coal burning and there was also more um, 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 nuclear power. Okay, our nuclear power plants have kind of shut down and the coal burning uh, aspect has gone down a bit but we still make our electricity from natural gas and other carbon dioxide producing uh, uh, formats. Uh, the other point I wanted to make is in this idea of the, it's not just the total carbon footprint, okay? It's also in the battery technology. And our biggest hurdle in the electric car industry is, uh, is batteries. Right now, ba uh, lithium batteries are kind of the king and lithium batteries have their issues. For example, they get hot, and uh, they, can, they can cause problems there. Another big problem is lithium is not abundant in the earth. And so uh, mining for lithium has really kicked in, but uh, there's still a limited supply. Uh, because I, I teach a, a astronomy classes, I've also got the data in my head about what is the proportion of lithium in the universe. And the, <laughs> the number is that, that for every trillion how many zeros is that after the one? Every trillion hydrogen atoms, there are 10 lithium atoms in the universe. And so there is just not enough lithium to go around for everyone. So, so that's one of the issues with, uh, with uh, or two of the issues, I guess, with, with electric cars. Uh, yeah. The other issue that I would like to bring up is that, you know, that we ended up, you know, um, in, the, in the last major oil crisis, the price of gas went up to almost $5 a gallon. And a lot of people bought hybrid cars and they would have bought electric cars at the time. The issue then became the fact that since people weren't spending their money on gasoline, they could live farther away. And so that change to more efficient cars did nothing because people just drove farther. And so, you know, this, this is a big issue that we also need to think about, you know, how, how can we, maybe we will, maybe we'll learn from this, this uh, um, pandemic that we can work from home and not have to drive farther if we choose to have to live farther away. I think one of, because we only have a few minutes left and I, I, Dave, did you want to maybe add something to the consensus among scientists about what will the earth and inhabitants face if we don't we'll deal with climate change? Um, I guess I could contribute to that too, since I'm a geoscientist also. I mean, the bottom line is that we are living the realities of climate change already. We are seeing increased wildfires, increased flooding, um, increased storm activity. We are really living in the moment. So yeah, the, the, the changes are here and they will get worse unless we turn this around. And I. I really feel like we should be ending this on a very positive note. And I think our discussion here today, um, I think the positive is that we are getting a very quick snapshot here right now to see what our view could be like with lower pollution in it. How we can be better humans to our next door neighbors and how important it is for us to have social contact and that we should be embracing that when we can. Um, that our environment can be better than it is. And if you like what you're seeing right now, then why change again? Try to use your bike more often try to reduce your waste production. Just keep at it, you know? Um, so I guess that's uh, my, uh, what I would like to say. And then and maybe Kelly, since you were one of our panelists also, do you have some, some final words as far as moving forward for what our students and everybody here 
what they can do to get involved um, politically also, what, what would be a, what smart things to do, I guess, if they wanna be active. Sure, so one thing I wanna mention is that I think we even have, if she's still in this, is um, some students who last year went to Sacramento to lobby on behalf of increased composting efforts at the community college system across the state. That would be a tremendous um, impact, right, if we could get policy to support that. So thinking about what you can do locally. Yeah, Amy, are you here? I don't know if she is, but I see some chat going on there from Sophia to Amy. Um, <laughs> so they did tremendous work, and if she wants to chime in, I'd be happy to, to have her um, do that. So all I have to say is that, you know, this really shouldn't be a partisan issue. And if you have people in your life who um, have taken it to that level and they say, oh, I don't believe in this or, you know, this person on this, this talking head here says that and so it can't be true. I would really encourage you to have a conversation with them and try to remove it from the political perspective. So rather than saying this is what my party supports or your party supports try to think about what's good for all of us uh, together and how we can make that change um, together i really think that there is an issue uh, linking it to economic recovery if we could do that there's so much opportunity um, to make progress on policy um, i don't know that i have seen anything that has been strong enough to make it happen yet but i'm really hopeful that some groups will put that together and um, I thought it was, you know, when Richard was talking, I kept thinking of like, maybe you have like a little Thanos on your shoulder. I don't know if you're a fan of uh, Marvel characters, but you, uh, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't know that the, the real answer for us is to lose half of the population. I, I mean, it's a quick answer, I suppose, but I tend to like people and I'm hopeful um, in the impact that they can have if we join together, we're innovative um, and we can come up with plans that maybe we didn't even see coming. You know, people used to talk about there wouldn't be enough food on the planet um, to feed this in increasingly growing population. And food science changed that, right? And we're able to now grow the food. Now, getting it to people is another issue, right? And we do see food insecurity. But I think that I have faith in the ingenuity that we have to make a difference. And we just have to be willing and open to those conversations. Um, I. I'm concerned about the extreme polarization that we're seeing. And I would encourage you and others uh, that you know to maybe try to think about different news sources that you're listening to when you think about this topic. Um, it's really easy for us to get into our little bubbles and even your algorithm, if you're looking for diverse information, the algorithm that Google has you tracked into is still going to present you material that it thinks you're gonna like. And so do your best to break out of your little uh, information bubble and hear what others are saying so that you can become more informed and be able to have these conversations. And I think it is as easy as talking to your neighbor and then your neighbor talks to their uncle and then their uncle talks to their mechanic. And you know, it, the, the snowball effect of having these conversations is meaningful. And you don't have to feel daunted like I can't, I think that's one of the issues is it's too big of a problem. It's too big of a problem for one person to feel empowered to make a change. Um, and so then we say, well, I can't change it. So I might as well not do anything. And the truth is if we all make some small changes that can start to add up and it can start to create a different kind of cultural approach to how we engage with our environment and a political system might reflect those changes that are happening on a, a deeper level. So I, I am hopeful, I hope we can remain hopeful and just keep trying, keep listening, keep learning, keep talking to people, um, be like Amy, go to Sacramento uh, <laughs> with your proposal, try to make change, knock on some doors, send some emails, um, you, can, you can do that. And I would love if James wanted to chime in too. He is our environmental politics professor, he designed that course. Uh, he's on the sustainability committee and incredibly active on our campus. So uh, Professor Stone, if you wanted to make some comments here, that would be great. Thank you, Kelly. <laughs> so James, you wanna have the closing word since it's six o'clock, you get to finish this off. A good source for public opinion polling on climate change is the Yale Center for Climate Communication. 
And one of the key takeaways, if you uh, look at their polling over the last 20 or more years, is it's true that there are points of agreement that, you know, liberals can find with conservatives, Democrats can find with Republicans on things like support for renewable energy, putting solar panels on your house, uh, government subsidies for buying an electric vehicle. But when it comes to the science of climate change and regulation of carbon emissions, there's a lot less point of agreement on that. You see some ups and downs over the years, but basically we wind up pretty much in the same place where we started 20 years uh, or 25 years later. And so I, I think the key point to emphasize here is the role of not the individual, you know, go out and uh, you know, buy green, as important as that is, uh, live a sustainable lifestyle, but the role of social movements um, and the role of political parties um, and working within political parties to push, you know, the right kinds of policies in achieving social change. So we have already a big race divestment as one of the tools, you know, for um, uh, pushing us in a more sustainable direction, reducing carbon dioxide emissions, and they've also endorsed a Green New Deal. The Sunrise Movement is behind that. And you uh, had Bernie Sanders kind of at the, uh, uh, the most um, bold position in terms of his embrace for Green New Deal, but Joe Biden has embraced it too. And so there's a lot at stake in 2020. And in terms of the messaging, you know, you already see these groups out protesting with their American flags um, and their Trump signs about ending the lockdown. The debate over climate is, is very much the same. Uh, the polling finds that people who watch Fox News, they started out supportive of a Green New Deal. The more they watch Fox, the less supportive they were. So the challenge for the climate movement and for all of us as environmentalists on the 50th Earth Day, Earth Day is to make our voices heard louder. That's number one. And then number two, think smarter about how uh, to message um, what we are saying about a Green New Deal and uh, the solutions to climate change. That includes, you know, that connecting it to economic prosperity for sure, like the Green New Deal does, but it also has to do a lot with uh, bringing us together as a people and coming up with a new vision of community that unites people across the usual lines of class and race and gender um, and lifestyle, sexual orientation, and so forth. So that's the note that I would end on, a new vision of community that's based in sustainability and prosperity. Thank you so much, James. And I want to make sure again to emphasize, I do believe that Every individual can and should make a difference. And somebody put it in the chat to, you know, eat red, uh, less red meat, for example. You know, just you, less is more, right? We don't need to buy new clothing all the time um, and, and so forth. There's just all, we can carpool, we can ride our bikes. Um, so I don't want us to go over too far, but I wanted to have, uh, Sophia, please, if you could announce the event that you still have planned for tomorrow. So, yes. So, hello, uh, this is Sophia. I'm currently the publicity senator and I am the student trustee elect. Tomorrow is the final day of this Earth Week. We're planning an event online via Zoom with the DJ and just bringing together the whole Mount Sac community. It's going to happen from 9 p.m. to midnight. That's right, after hours. So after you're all done from Zoom University, you can come by, just tune in and reconnect with your Mounties um, and celebrate Earth Day, Earth Week. Mm -hmm. Awesome. So a great shout out again to Sophia. Sophia is our student rep on our sustainability um, committee and she has um, really been the driving force to put these three days of events together um, so thank you, Sophia. Um, I want to thank everybody for being here. Um, we are a great Mountie community. Um, we're all doing our share. I hope you're all well, and um, we'll see you guys tomorrow, maybe, and otherwise on the next Zoom. <laughs> Take care, everybody. Thank you. Bye now.